Hey, 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 hey. What you doing here? Don't you have practice? Not anymore. I quit. Oh. Well, since when are you the quitting kind? I don't know. I just don't see the point anymore. So you didn't make the dress list. There are greater tragedies in the world. I wanted to run out of that tunnel for my dad. To prove to everyone prove that I worked... Prove what? That I was somebody. Oh, you are so full of crap. You're five feet nothing. A hundred and nothing. And you got hardly a speck of athletic ability. And you hung in with the best college football team in the land for two years. And you're also going to walk out of here with a degree from the University of Notre Dame. In this lifetime, you don't have to prove nothing to nobody except yourself. And after what you've gone through, if you haven't done that by now, it ain't going to never happen. Now go on back. Sorry, I never got you to see your first game in here. I've seen too many games in this stadium. I thought you said you never saw a I've game. I've never seen a game from the stands. You were a player? I rode the bench for two years. Thought I wasn't being played because of my color. I got filled up with a lot of attitude. So I quit. Still not a week goes by, I don't regret it. And I guarantee a week won't go by in your life, you won't regret walking out, letting them get the best of you. Do you hear me clear enough? Making decisions to go forward in life. Big decisions like maybe it's college, maybe it's marriage, kids, having a family, maybe it's a job. All of these decisions take us somewhere new. And we have to leave the old things behind. And this isn't easy. We know it requires a lot of courage sometimes, or maybe a lot of nerve. Most of the time, we just prefer that things would remain the same, or possibly even go back to how they used to be. We seek what is familiar instead of what is so uncertain. I heard this recently in a message that I was listening to that said, God is a direction, and the only successful direction ever has been going forward. Now, you have to pardon the football references this morning a little, but I love football, and football season's upon us. It's a new season, still a little fresh. The Lions have only tied once, um, so that's good news for all of us that are Lions fans. Um, woo, they, they are still undefeated, right? That's, we'll take it, right, Derek? There's no doubt. But one other thing that I'm reminded of when we think of this direction of going forward is the forward pass in football. Uh, if you are a football person, you would know that the forward pass was not always part of the game. It was actually developed later on. And a big piece of why the forward pass took a long time to catch on is because it's a bit risky if you think about what's actually happening. happening. A quarterback takes the ball from the center, whether he's in shotgun, which means he's a little distance behind, or under center right there to get the, the exchange, drops back to pass, and he's looking for a receiver. A tight end or a wide receiver could be a running back. He's going to throw the ball actually downfield. And while he does that, everything hangs in the balance. The fans in the stadium are watching, taking it all in. It hangs in the balance. The fans on TV, it's much more stressful on TV because you don't see the receiver yet. Ooh, it's really bad. The coach is on the sideline. It hangs in the balance. There's a defense that's trying to interfere with this whole thing. There's a defensive back who's legally trying to interfere with the pass completion happening. And sometimes they illegally interfere with that and they get a flag, but that's a different story. I'm reminded that, that God is the direction. It's going forward. Like that football pass, there's risk involved. Everything hangs in the balance as we move forward through life. There was a group of people that we encounter in the Old Testament, and they are God's chosen group. The original tribe that God would work with. This group is special. God's work in all of the human race was through them and in, in the entire world was gathering a community, gathering a group of people. And we're going to be looking at post-rebellion in the garden and post the great flood. But after that, God calls this man named Abraham. 
and then promises to make Abraham's descendants as numerous as, anyone know? The stars, the stars in the sky. You guys are good. That was a good rhetorical question that you guys jumped in on. Abraham and his son and grandson Isaac and Jacob respectively become patriarchs of what we know as the Jewish nation, this special God community. And as bearers of a belief in one true God, they settle in the land of Israel or the promised land. But eventually famine hits this land of Israel and the Israelites are forced to migrate to the land of Egypt. But fortunately for them, for the community, Abraham's great-grandson Joseph was already in Egypt and he had done the work. And it was awful work. If you know the story of Joseph, he was jailed, he went, was falsely accused, he went through a lot, but he had done the work to gain favor there. So, after some time, the Israelites, they go, they relocate to Egypt, and as God had promised, this nation begins to multiply and grow. But one problem, that big group, as their numbers grew, they began to be a threat to the safety and security of Egypt. And the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, decides, hey, we've got to do something about this. So now the Israelites are enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. During this time, there's a lot of crying out as slavery is a, an awful thing to be part of and to be subjugated to, subject to. So finally, later, Moses, a familiar name for many of us, leads these folks out of captivity. They cross the Red Sea, and then they enter a period of 40 years of wa uh, wilderness wandering. And during this time, God then gives the Israelites the Torah, which means law of God. And this wasn't just an instruction book for the righteous living of each individual. Rather, it was a collective of laws that gave shape to how this special, set-apart, holy people, how they would be brought together and chosen to be different than the violent and the cruel and the self-indulgent pagan nations around them. And after their time of wandering through the desert, they, they finally, after leaving Egypt, this growing nation of Israel does make its way back to the promised land or the land of Israel. And after some, there's, there's lots of events. We're giving you the huge 10,000 foot overview if you haven't already caught on just to get us up to speed where we're going this morning. After this time, there, we get into a period where we, we have uh, leaders that come about and they're called judges. And during this judge time, every generation of Israelites falls into a pretty bad cycle. This cycle went like this. They would first forget God's laws and commands, which were given to them by God through Moses. Then a foreign invasion would take place and they would bring oppression. Then they would cry out to God for help. And finally, God would send a judge, or another word for that would be deliverer, to save them. It's a vicious cycle. I think we can relate a little to that cycle at times, too. Then, after this period of judges was beginning to come to an end, the monarchy is established. And that's where we're heading today with the text. If you are on our email list, you received a midweek update, and you, uh, you got a little heads up of where we're going today. We're going to be in 1 Samuel 8, and Pat's already queued up and stuff. We'll get there in just a minute. But as this judge period began to come to a close, there was one last judge, and his name was Samuel. And he was a prophet too, and he was the one calling to the people of God the Israelites, to turn from all wickedness and come back to God's law in this better way of living that he had given them through the Torah, the law of God. And in 1 Samuel 8, we learn that Samuel is getting old and he appointed his sons to take his place. There's just one problem. The sons of his were not like their dad, Samuel. They were greedy. They had a distorted view of justice and they took bribes. That sounds a little familiar maybe to a few of you out there. Maybe that sounds like, whoa, we see that now, currently. So the elders of Israel come to Samuel and they say, and this is out of 1 Samuel 8, 5, which is not up on the screens, just listen here. It says, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all other nations have. And this didn't please Samuel. He was not thrilled. He believed that this was a community of God's chosen people called to be something different, something unique, chosen to be different than the violent and the cruel and the self-indulgent other nations around them. But these people of Israel wanted a visible king, someone they could see. 
So Samuel takes this to God, and God tells Samuel to give them a king, stating that they have continued to abandon me, God's talking about himself, and follow other gods ever since I brought them out of Egypt. And now they are giving you the same treatment. We're going to pick up the text here. This is in 1 Samuel 8, 9 through 22. And this is God speaking here at the start. And he says this, Do as they ask, referring to the Israelites talking to Samuel. Do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. So Samuel passed on the Lord's warning to the people who were asking him for a king. This is how a king will reign over you, Samuel said. The king will draft your sons and assign them to his chariots and his charioteers making them run before his chariots. Some will be generals and captains in his army. Some will be forced to plow in his fields and harvest his crops. And some will make his weapons and chariot equipment. The king will take your daughters from you and force them to cook and bake and make perfumes for him. He will take away the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his own officials. He will take a tenth of your grain and your grape harvest and distribute it among his officers and attendants. He will take your male and female slaves and demand the finest of your cattle and donkeys for his own use. He will demand a tenth of your flock and you will be his slaves. When that day comes, you will beg for relief from this king that you are demanding. But then the Lord will not help you. But the people, they refuse to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, we still want a king, they said. We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. So Samuel repeated to the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord replied, Do as they say and give them a king. Then Samuel agreed and sent the people home. There's a really strong desire in all of us that considers all the challenge about being called for something different. Being called to trust God. Being called to go forward in possibly a new way, a new direction. And it causes us to look around and even look back and then answer, no way. Not me. Not this time. Not today. Give us a king. Then we can just be like everybody else. Give me the easy path so I can be like others that have the apparent easy path. They have comfort. I want that. Give me back my past so I can have those feelings like I used to. This morning we're going to discover together here in just the next few minutes how everyone can accept the cost of being called by shaking off some common setbacks. The first setback that we have to shake off is this setback that we want to avoid all risk. We have to shake off the setback that we desire to avoid all risk. With being called to trust God, there simply comes risk. And we are people that usually prefer security and protection. We want to be shielded from all possible harm. And taking on risk really brings about all of this possibility of hazards and threats and instability. It makes us vulnerable, exposed, or susceptible. The nation of Israel had a moment here in the text we read where they were afraid of the continued risk. They wanted to avoid the possible hazards, harm, or vulnerability. They looked around ignoring the call of God to be a unique, special community that was opposed to cruel and self-indulgent ways. And as if God's protection and providence all the way from their ancestors, Abraham, through Moses, all the way to the judges, and then to Samuel, as if that wasn't enough demonstration of God's care. They saw the risk of continued dependence upon God and his true kingdom ethics and said, no, that's just too risky. It's too vulnerable. We're too exposed. Give us a king. Then we can be like everybody else. The Israelites wanted a plan B, the second option, a plan A that just wasn't working so well for them. And they wanted a different route. You see, the call to move past risk builds some really positive things like creativity, while avoiding risk only stokes a fear of failure. 
new problems and new experiences create a need for learning new skills. A new way to tackle the issues at hand, a new plan of attack towards the dilemmas of life. And if we never experience any failure, we never really get to have moments of true success. There's a famous designer, and uh, bringing up a famous designer, Vera Wang. Raise your hand if you know who Vera Wang is, so at least I know a few of you are with me. Cool. And it's almost, almost 100% ladies, which that's not shocking. And except Jamie, because Jamie's fashionable. He gets it, man. He's good. I know who Vera Wang is, too, before, before even this. So. He, Jamie's, Jamie is. He's, he gets fashion. He's good. He's got a daughter that keeps him in line, too, if, if Leslie doesn't, right? So it's good. Daughters are good for uh, keeping us looking well. But so there's this famous designer, Vera Wang. And although she is a famous designer now, she actually always had this dream of being a pro figure skater. And she was actually really good, too. She actually was on the, uh, competed in the U.S. Figure Skating Championships, but unfortunately she didn't make the 1968 U.S. Olympic team. So as part of her figuring out what is the next step, she decided to pursue a career in magazine editing. And at some point in that process, she didn't land the lead editor job for Vogue magazine, the editor-in-chief. And so she changed gears again and she went to Ralph Lauren where she actually became the design director for accessories. But feeling at some point that, that the fashion world was just didn't have enough to offer as she began planning her own wedding and there just wasn't quality dresses and things, she changed gears. And it, that led her to pursue developing and creating her own bridal line, which today Vera Wang is one of the most top respected designers. She's worth over $400 million. Figure skater to world-renowned designer. Interesting how that works. Not every risk will result in wild success like this, but if it does, I'm glad you're part of our community here because $400 million is a lot of money. But it won't, won't result in wild success, but we do learn in the process. We find a need for new skills, a creative approach to problems. We find some successes and then... We see how those successes curb our fear of failure. And as followers of Jesus, amen, if you're with me, as followers of Jesus, we call this trust or faith in God. We see how he's been faithful and it encourages us even more. We don't become so fearful. Instead, we learn to trust more tightly to his promises and his goodness. Avoiding risk is a natural response. But by working to shake it off, we can experience how new trust in God, a new creative approach, and even learn some new skills that we maybe didn't know that we had. I see it as this way. We have two options right here. You can either risk the feelings of disappointment or failure, which could happen, or you have a choice to live disappointed. You can either risk the feeling of failure, of disappointment, or you can choose to live disappointed. The next step back to accepting the cost of being called is that we prioritize comfort. We must shake off the prioritizing of comfort in order to accept the cost of being called. About a year ago, I finally got to upgrade to a nice desk chair in my office. And before that, this was a year ago, so for about eight years, I sat on one of these lovely seats that you guys are on. And you're, you're probably feeling pretty comfy. These are nice. There's still some good padding in there. But now, I have lumbar support. <laughs> lumbar support. Fancy. You guys, now you, now you are aware of your lower back and you're feeling like, hey, I could use, you've got to straighten up your posture a little bit. And, and I have this ability to lower my seat or raise it. It's amazing. The arms can go down or up. It's this fancy chair. It swivels. I can lock it in place so I can't rock or I can unlock it and I can rock. You guys know what a desk chair is, right? But I'm, I'm selling this to you, right? I could sell you this desk chair. And up until I got one of these fine chairs, um, you know, if something happened now, I wouldn't want to go back to this chair. If something happened and this thing breaks on me or the youth kids who meet in there during after church, be kind to that chair. Don't break it. But if something happens... I don't want to go back to one of these chairs because once you experience comfort, it is really hard to want anything else. Are you with me? Once you experience, once you've felt a good chair, I don't want to go back to a not good chair. Oh, 
I mean, I dealt with that for eight years, but I wouldn't want to experience de desk life without it. There's something tangible about comfort. You can actually feel it. And waiting on God, depending on God like the Israelite nation and like we do, typically doesn't feel like comfort. Correct? It's hard. Humans are biologically wired to avoid pain, to avoid discomfort, anything of the sort, because we see it as a threat, which could even lead to death. Now, a chair probably won't do that to you, but it could hurt you. I mean, think about whether it's awkward social encounters. Oh, goodness. Maybe it's really tough exercise. Maybe you've been hanging out. Is Kelly up here? There's Kelly in the back. Maybe you've been going to Zumba class and working hard with Kelly. That's really tough exercise. Okay? Or even sometimes waking up early. I've been talking to the youth kids. We have some kids that their schedule has changed, and they're getting up at awful hours. And so are their parents. I know the Labazos are one of the, that group. I do know the Cones, uh, Allie's getting used to a really early morning now too. And um, it's crazy. So we're even just averse to waking up early. But throughout the Psalms, King David reminds us to trust in God, to take heart, to be courageous, to remain calm too. Isaiah the prophet discusses how waiting on the Lord will renew your strength. And how God is in control and will bring it to come. The Apostle Paul urges all of us to not be anxious about anything. He also reminds us that we do not have a spirit of fear or apprehension, but we have a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Even Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, after having discussed with the crowd and the disciples the cost of following him, he then, they're out on the storm, there's a storm at sea, and then he calms the storm and he asks his disciples, why are you afraid? He says, you have so little faith. The Israelites had experienced this uncomfortable part of life, of dependence upon God. They lived that cycle. That cycle again was they would forget God's laws and commands. They'd get comfortable. Then a foreign invasion would come and take place and bring oppression. Then they would cry out to God. Then finally God would send a, deliver to, a deliverer to save them. Israel has a problem. We're looking around and seeing the comfort of everyone around them. They all seem to have it really good. They have a king that keeps everything in line. A king that brings order. You know whether you're in good or bad standing. You know where the lines are clearly. It isn't so ambiguous. It's way more clear cut. I know when the work is done, when I meet the quota and when I did my part, and then I get to check out. Maybe if we just had what they had, we'd be reassured. We could just be like them and have it all. We could rest in comfort knowing that our king is taking care of business. All the while forgetting that we're called to something different. That was Israelites' problem. Israel's issue. And I think it's still applicable to all of us here. It's a real struggle. And so here at First Church, this collective of Jesus people, this community we too are called for something different called as individuals and called together as a collective we are big we are part of the big c church the one true church of jesus so i ask is how are we going to work through and shake off these setbacks so that we too can begin to go forward trusting god as a called people what role do we play here in Greenville in the kingdom of God? Our friend Pete talked about this a little a few weeks back, so if you're here, that's a familiar statement. What is our role in the kingdom of God in Greenville, in Montcalm County, even into Ionia County with our friends from Belding? What is that? Why have we been brought together? Why have we endured for almost 100 years? Do you realize that next year is a 100-year celebration? Greenville First Church of God has endured for a hundred years. That's cool. That's worth celebrating. There's a reason we've been called. Are there places where we let risk and comfort hold us back? Where have we tried to give up and just ask for a king so that we could be like everybody else? This clip that we started today with, uh, as we kind of begin to wrap up, I'd like to give you that little cue so you know. This is a clip from the movie Rudy. Is that a familiar movie at all to anyone? You know me enough by now that I'm a Michigan fan, so I don't really like Notre Dame. But Rudy is a great movie. 
And it's actually based on a true story. And I'm sure it's Hollywooded up a little bit. But it is based on a true story. And so I just want to give you a little setup in case you're not familiar with that story. That Rudy is this tiny little guy. His friend and mentor telling him that you're five foot nothing, a hundred and nothing. You ain't got any athletic ability. That's all true. Rudy was that little runt of a kid kind of thing. But he felt, and I'm stretching this a little bit to say, he felt a call, a burning desire that he was going to be a Notre Dame football player. And in case you don't know anything about high-level Division I football, those people are the giants walking among us, okay? If you're five foot nothing, 120 pounds or less, you don't really belong there, okay? But he still had this dream. And so every step of the way, he was always kind of the overlooked one. So he gets into high school and he's got a ton of heart and character. Even his high school football coach talks about that. He's got the most heart. If they could take his heart out and just his passion and put it in any of the bigger kids, man, I'd be like an all-American kid but he doesn't have it. So Rudy's still, though, determined after leaving high school, he's going to get to Notre Dame. Well, he tries to get to Notre Dame, doesn't have the grades to even get in. So he begins to go through junior college. Okay? And so he enrolls, and he works really hard, and semester after semester, he's applying to get into Notre Dame, and finally it's the last chance, it's his last semester where he can actually try to transfer into Notre Dame, Whew, and he gets in. It's a lot of hard work. So now he's at Notre Dame. He's enrolled as a student. So now he can actually try to walk onto the football team. And he does. He walks on. Even though he is half the size in so many ways to all these other football players. Again, his heart and his passion allows him to find a spot as a walk-on. One problem. No one has ever believed in Rudy. So even though he tells his parents, I'm enrolled at Notre Dame, I'm on the team as a walk-on. They don't believe it because he hasn't dressed for a football game yet. See, he's a walk-on, and the old rules, you can only dress so many players at home games, which they've changed now. You can dress everybody now in college football at home games. So Rudy was faced, as we saw in the scene, this is the last moment. This is going through the week, his final home game at Notre Dame, his last chance to be on the dress list, and he finds out he's not on the dress list. He's not going to get to run out, on, out of the tunnel. He'll be in the stands where his family's all thought he's just been a fan, never a player, never involved. And he's ready to quit. He's in that last week. He's done all this work. It's like the pinnacle moment in his life. He's moving through it. But in this last week, the risk, the comfort, all that he had, he says it's time to, time to be done. And in his life, that, that mentor of his becomes such a key person. And, and maybe that's where you have that person to talk some sense into you because he's reminding him of all he's accomplished. He's going to walk away with a degree from Notre Dame University. He's done more than most of the people we could ever even imagine. And he's grueled through all these practices and being, frankly, a tackling dummy. That's why I showed you all those clips of hits. Physically getting beat up. And he reminds them, man, you've already been doing it. You're doing the work. Don't quit now. And so I want to show you here just this last clip to kind of wrap that up. The story of Rudy. Go ahead, Pat. The best stories are full of adventure and quests and journeys and all the risk that that really entails. They are tense and they're suspenseful and maybe they're even scary at times. But then when it comes to our real lives, 
We tend to prefer what is always familiar and always comfortable and secure and playing it safe. We want to make our story simple. To make it as easy as possible. But that really isn't a story that's worthy of how grand life is. See, we're not fixed beings. Life is a lived experience of growth and a failure and constantly keeping ourselves open to new ideas and new ways and new leading from the Spirit. Having been called by Jesus to follow and to trust, we're continually asking ourselves whether we maybe admit this or not, am I convinced that what lies before me is better than what was behind? Do I trust that journeying into the unknown with Jesus is better than what I've experienced and known? Will we accept the risk of being called to something better, something more? Will we agree to de-emphasize comfort, knowing that my growth, our growth, is more important. I always like to leave you with a couple actionable steps when appropriate because we don't just want to be hearers, correct? We want to be hearers and doers. We don't just gather just to hear. We, we come here, we gather together, we want to hear, we want to do. We want to be the church not just at 10 a.m. on Sundays. We got to be the church at 2 p.m. on Monday afternoons when we're all like, I got a bad case of the Mondays. So a few actionable steps, things to think about here. Over the next week, I I want you to to look for opportunities to practice accepting a little risk and maybe working towards de-emphasizing your comfort. And a few ideas. Maybe that looks like a difficult conversation or maybe an awkward social conversation or interaction that you know that you have to have. I talk about this often. We get the weird feeling in our stomach because we think, oh, I probably should reach out out to Betsy. And it, it makes us get the butterflies. That's usually telling us that is a conversation we should have. It just means it's uncomfortable. There's a little risk. There's a little lack of comfort there. It could be a new workout program or lifestyle change. Maybe you've been really saying, I got to do it. This is the week. Maybe I'll actually get up and I'll go for a walk a little bit. Maybe I'll actually uh, throw a couple pieces of broccoli on my plate and I'll choke them down. I like broccoli though. So I like to, there's other vegetables I don't like that I would normally say, but I, I don't want, I, I like broccoli. So I'll throw broccoli out there. But maybe it might look like just getting up an extra 20 minutes early so that you can spend a little more time with your spouse in the morning before the day takes off. Or with your family. Oh no, okay, or with your family. (laughs) Oh no. Or maybe it's spending an extra, getting up an extra 20 minutes early, which is not fun. I enjoy the call of bed to stay in there. But maybe it's 20 minutes so you can just sit in silence and pray and listen to God to recalibrate your morning. Maybe that's something you can consider. Maybe it's like Vera Wang here as we use that example that you're ready for a career change. Maybe it's time. Maybe you've been putting that up off to pursue a new dream that you know that you've been called to. Something is wrestling in here and you can't deny that anymore. Now please don't go to your boss tomorrow and just quit. (laughs) Don't hear that. Because if you come back and you tell me, well, I, I did what you said was an actionable step. No, don't do that. But you know, and maybe it's you in this room right now that you have been wrestling with that. Maybe you know that in order for something that you need to have happen in your family life, in your world, that it's time. Consider that. And, and maybe, this is our last one, that maybe you're dealing with lots of anger in your life or hatred. Possibly you're wrestling with depression and anxiety type related stuff. Maybe you need to go and see a professional about that. We have good friends here. I'm always available too as, as what I would call low-level counseling, to hear your story, to listen. But sometimes we need a professional's help. And I don't know if that always gets shared from a pulpit enough. We have faith in Jesus. And that is a huge step in the right direction. But sometimes we need someone that can actually help us work through things. So maybe that's you. Maybe this is your process to get well. And it isn't comfortable at first. Maybe sometimes you feel like your reputation's on the line because, wow, I can't go to counseling or something like that. I would encourage you to take that step. Maybe that's the risk, the uncomfortable part that you need to go through. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're indeed grateful that we get to experience being called, that you love us so much 
that Jesus came to earth, took on human flesh, dwelt among us. 